Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today we are going to take a look at the magical world of cryptocurrencies. You can think of it as part two of the lecture that I gave along with Professor R.V. Uh, last Friday. And uh, this is a follow up, but it takes a little bit more of a slightly different look at this thing what are the different factors influencing uh, cryptocurrencies and where do these 17,000 blah 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 whatever the number of cryptocurrencies that are coming out of the woodworks fit in an ecosystem and and to understand all these things let's welcome our subject matter expert Sridhar Chityalaji. Sridharji Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel sir as always it's a pleasure to have you on our channel. Namaskar and good morning, good afternoon, good day to everybody, wherever you are. So, uh, you know, we uh, set the context uh, once upon a time and then uh, very soon, then you had a very detailed discussion around cryptos as it, uh, as it is being viewed around the world and probably in India. Uh, so I think we are now expanding further on the specific topic and uh, who better than uh, Sri IRG, who is an expert by himself on the blockchain ecosystem uh to lead and uh you know ask me all the difficult questions for which i have no answers but i shall try sir i'm going to set the stage right away you know some of the early adopters of cryptocurrencies have been people who are the mega rich kevin durant the famous basketball star some of the big vcs uh, they, they have all been the first ones to embrace this. Uh, Elon Musk is another one. I can go on. Now, what is it that attracted these high net worth individuals to cryptocurrency? Clearly, these people have IQs um, and north of 130 or 140. So what was it that attracted them to cryptocurrencies? I'm talking about over the last few years. Now it is kind of beginning to cast the imagination of many people. They think that this is the next big thing. All that is fine. But all this started because these were the early adopters. What was it that attracted them to this? Sir? Well, I think it's a, thank you. It's a very fascinating question. Uh, what drives uh, venture capitalists uh, and what defines market players to not use the traditional models, but to look at the non-traditional frameworks. What? Because they see opportunities which others don't, and they would like to be the early ones to make the play, if I have to use the sporting terminology, and to create a disproportionate uh, benefit or an outcome that comes out of it, where you can see some of the magical plays, doesn't matter whether it is basketball or whether it is football, you see that there are some magical moments where they make things that you and I would not attempt to do. And it results in an outcome which uh, steers them away from the masses and the crowds. So it is the same mindset in the venture capital uh, and some of the big business league players such as Elon Musk or be it uh, you know, you know, Jeff Bezos or be it uh, Mark Andreessen or Mark Cuban for that matter, you know, they, they make plays which you people don't. And then, oh, Elon Musk, you take the case in the, you know, or Pierre Omidyar in the case of, uh, you know, PayPal. And who would have thought that, you know, PayPal would be a network, a payment mechanism, uh, as well as uh, a client and customer driven economic system. Would anybody have thought? No, they made the play when others said it will not, it's not feasible. And then they de derive uh, in a disproportionate outcomes out of it. It's exactly very similar that what we are witnessing within the crypto economic system or ecosystem. So I want to delineate between a currency versus the ecosystem, right? There's a fun, there's a difference. So therefore, we are beginning to see slow but steady influx of people, you know, with rich, uh, you know, what you call ability and aptitude uh, and attitude to put their money to work. To gain benefit. Sridharji, I want to kind of try and define the scope of this large ecosystem of uh, cryptocurrencies. And I'm going to give a very simplistic example, Sridharji. Many of us have been to casinos. You go to a casino, then what happens is you put your money in and you trade them for chips. 
and then you use the chips to play games blackjack uh, russian roulette poker whatever what have you and at the end of the day well depending on how many chips you have you go back to the cashier and then you encash it back to real world cash now is this kind of an analogy like for example does cryptocurrency have to have this kind of an ecosystem and I also must mention that the chips given in one casino can be used only in that casino you cannot take those chips and use it in another casino so there is a ecosystem involved and the casino is the one giving you the backstop meaning like if you win wildly the casino is still bound to give you the cash your winnings so in terms of uh, maybe this is a simplistic you know comparison but what do you feel is cryptocurrency is this the kind of thing that might be one of the applications so no i think it's a great context it's a great framework so i think from a simplistic understanding point of view you can actually simulate the exact model that you have outlined you go to your casino right so what happens you have a bank account or you have a debit card or whatever it is you have a check uh, they're willing to encash the check and give you you know you have one million you have one million if Kerry Packer, the late Kerry Packer goes, he probably puts 100 million. Uh, if, uh, you know, one of these big, I don't want to mention the names, big basketball players or football players go, you know, they're going in with, you know, X amount of millions of dollars, cash guarantee. So they get a bunch of, uh, you know, you know, Bellagio cryptos or, you know, MGM Studios cryptos or uh, Venetian uh, cryptos. What are these? You know, they look like, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, a million, uh, what you call tokens. Uh, that's the terminology that is used here, tokens. They are non-fungible tokens because the reason is that particular token is not, cannot be duplicated. It is, you know, one single purpose use. So you take that, now you go and sit with a fellow set of players and, you know, who have a similar, you go to different tables who have different uh, capacities to uh, make uh, the initial plays. And then you begin, the game commences. And there are a whole bunch of people watching to see that there is no fraud, there is no cheating. Uh, whether you want to call them arbitrators, exchanges, uh, game makers, market players, whatever you may want to call them, you can call these players and the game commences. People win, people lose. Uh, they exchange their, uh, when they win, they get their uh, uh, tokens. And when they lose, they give away their tokens or the scripts uh, or the chips. And then the person at the end of the finish, he has probably a security guard or so whatever it is, he goes and says, okay, take and cash and put it into this bank account or give me one large red chip, which is hundred million dollars. And I'll take that hundred million home and I'll come back because I'm going to play a game tomorrow. So the crypto ecosystem is very much, very similar, right? So you have a cash and you have a mining, the mining, the mines basically mine the crypto tokens or the cryptocurrency as it's called there's only limited supply there's only limited amount per casino or per coin in this case you know it could be bitcoin it could be ethereum it could be dogecoin it could be uh smart coin it could be any one of those uh, you know hundred thousand coins but there's only about 10 or 20 of them which hold the sway and they are limited purpose they are for defined purpose and they're used in the ecosystem now, let me take another example. So I say, hey, you know, I just lost. I go to my friend. Uh, can I can I get a 10,000 script from you? You know, here's my, here's my guarantee, my name. So he gives me. So similarly, you can go and borrow in the appropriate venues. And then you got the thing. And then you play because they validate whether that is issued by the specific, um, in this case, at a specific exchange or by the specific um, uh, casino. And then you make the play and there are people who can borrow at very defined different set of interest rates so you have a market system that goes towards you know the borrowing so to get back to the point you have now created an ecosystem where you play games with a currency or with a yes, uh, with a token that is very um, relevant and very um, appropriate to that specific casino and people win people lose and and basically the game goes on now remember many of these casinos are listed okay many of them are listed in stock exchanges why are they listed because 
it is a legalized venue for these events to occur. And every time there is a volume of activity in this, there is an income stream that is generated by that specific venue, which directly gets flowed on to the investors by way of benefit. So these are regulated money making, regulated cash raising uh, ecosystems or what you called as this too. We have other forms of entertainment that goes on for which you can consume and pay with the same tokens. But in, in a scenario that we just described, we have effectively mimicked a crypto ecosystem. What are the two differences between what you see in a casino versus what you see in a crypto ecosystem? The casinos where these games happen with the same type of a model are regulated. They pay taxes, including the guy who buys the winnings is taking the net winnings, the tax is collected. And in some cases, in some exchanges, some casinos get even waiver for individual taxes. So you don't pay uh, because it is collected as a group and the game goes on. So they are regulated, monitored and, and the things work. What's in the traditional world, it is still evolving because it is not yet a very mature industry as yet. But this bulwark that is going on, that uh, that this is all illegal and so on, is complete nonsense. Sridharji, I get your point. Now, 17,000 cryptocurrencies can all not be chasing the same uh, customer. They must be differentiating themselves. Perhaps you can walk us through this evolving crypto ecosystem and the investors who are backing this ecosystem so that our viewers have an understanding of how much of a uh, traction, attraction, uh, how much of traction this particular technology is gathering now. Over to you, sir. Well, I think when you come to the ecosystem, if we can have that slide, uh, that would help us. Okay, so we have the ecosystem here. So what do you see is the ecosystem? You have first and foremost wallets. Why you need wallets? You need wallets because you need a place to keep your tokens, which you can exchange, or uh, you know, value stores, which you can exchange. It's just like I go to an ATM, I draw money, and I put it into my wallet. I carry it out, and I use uh, I use my wallets. So you have a whole set of players within the wallet world. Now, each of these wallets can work only uh, with uh, very spe within specific exchanges, uh, which allow exchange of value. Uh, and uh, and even uh, you know you can buy from one currency to another currency. You talked about seventeen hundred or eighteen hundred people play. Uh, you know, many ninety percent of them don't get recognized because you need an exchange. For example, Binance. Yes, uh, you know you have the Bitcoin. You will see also uh, you know various kinds. You know, they're basically a Bitmap is another one which is uh, uh, you know Bitcoin based, and then you have crypto which is uh, accepts more than you know one currency so you have the current various exchanges and these exchanges come up come up and they are able to recognize what you call as protocols of the various wallets within which you have the tokens or the value stores which you can use these exchanges to buy sell uh, and uh, to other types of activities then you have the blockchain platforms you know the blockchain platforms are those which are used to connect the wallets to exchanges to various venues where you can basically engage in types of appropriate activities. Now we are given two, which is DeFi, which is decentralized finance ecosystem. And then you can also do gaming. And then you have, I mentioned to you, NFT. NFT is uh, uh, what you call non-fungible tokens, which means that you know you, that token cannot be uh, replaced, reproduced, duplicated, and it is you know one off. Uh, then you have various tools uh, that are available for you to manage if you are an investor, uh, if you are buying and selling and holding a store of value. And they are always linked to a defined currency, which is US dollar or uh, euro or the, as the case may be. And depending on the velocity of volume and velocity of value, you begin to see currencies, each of these uh, scripts having different stores of value. Why is Bitcoin 50,000? And why is Ethereum, you know, um, 4,000? 4, you know, yeah. 4,000. And why is Dogecoin, you know, $4? Uh, 
and why is something else 10 cents it's just this basically because depth and the value and the volume of activity that happens within with that specific token or the unit of store so that is uh, so this is typically the ecosystem and in terms of decentralized finance we'll come to that when we get to that place so you have wallets you have exchanges you have blockchain platforms you have infrastructure which ties connects all these pieces and then you have what they call as the stable coins the stable coins are those uh, you know which are you know which are um, have a defined value and uh, recognized and accepted um, and you have various types of tools and you can use gaming or you can use decentralized finance models to engage in activities uh, using the this ecosystem uh, with a defined currency as the store of value behind your tokens or behind your things. Why is world agitated? Because there are wrong mechanisms that when you make gains, how to collect tax, when you make losses, and when you do th types of things, how you regulate these activities, it is evolving. So therefore, a fear and apprehension comes from not being in control of the ecosystem rather than it being simply fraudulent because we use the example of a very simple example that Sri Iyer is at the context, you know, a casinos. Thank you very much, Sridharji. Now let's take a quick look at those people who are putting their money behind this ecosystem. Sridharji, you can share perhaps some of the players who are putting their money, some of the venture capitalists, and, and in various sectors that they are putting their money. So we have an idea. I have a follow up. I'll have some questions on stablecoin and other things a little bit later, DeFi also. But let's let's finish this and then come back to that because that gets into a little bit more of the details of a particular type of a cryptocurrency. So go ahead, Sridharji. I think if you can uh, show uh, show the next slide so people can get the benefit. So you have what they call as the traditional venture capitalists. You know, who are the traditional venture capitalists? You know, uh, Kindred, Google Ventures, Mosaic Ventures, uh, Cantos, Task, Kosla Ventures, Bain Capital, Intel Capital. So you have traditional VCs investing in this specific space. You also have your big names such as... Uh, you know, Sequoia, Rubicon, Vnext, SV Angels, Kleiner Perkins, uh, you know, so you can see the names for yourself. So there are various players who are what you call multi-asset uh, class venture capital investors, including Lightspeed, etc. I may have talked about Andreessen. So you have these uh, uh, players. Then you have people who are very specifically focused around uh, the crypto, uh, you know, digital currency group, uh, okay, Neo Capital Group, uh, Medici, you know, DFC, uh, etc. So you have the very specific crypto venture capital. You also have asset management companies involved. You know, Grayscale and FBG Capital comes to mind uh, of an of, of an immediate. Um, then you have the hedge funds. Uh, you know, hedge funds. Uh, see, you know, they invest in both traditional and non-traditional markets. You know, uh, and so you have the traditional, you have the hedge funds, uh, you know, making a play because they see an opportunity. You know, you don't see uh, too many fund of funds, but fund of funds also are investing in this specific space. This is beyond individual high net worth investors, uh, you know, who invest uh, their private money. And, you know, these are investments range anything from, you know, 5 million, 10 million to hundreds of millions of dollars get invested. And, you know, remember, this is a three trillion dollars uh, ecosystem right now. Uh, three trillion dollars valuation on the cryptocurrencies that are in the market. Uh, you know, the issue value may be only uh, you know one billion or five billion, but the market value of that is around three trillion, reflecting the disproportionate gain. This is what sends people into tremors by saying, "This is a gambling casino. You're going to come out." I actually suggest to them to go and look at the market cap of Microsoft, Google, or Alphabet, Apple, um, then Tesla, um, or for that matter, uh, Netflix. Go and basically take a look at the market cap of these companies. 
they are in one trillion to three trillion dollars mark what is one which comes very close on a market cap jp morgan around 450 to less than 500 billion dollars so therefore you are looking at a market which has grown basically because of adoption and economic outcome that one foresees in terms of deployed capital and what the returns that are generated many of these large trillion dollars companies have no debt in the balance sheet like the traditional companies that they that that one has these companies have got debt in the balance sheet they raise debt in the markets they deploy that and they generate an outcome and therefore they're able to pay um, you know high grade to low grade uh, returns on the debt that they raise but not these companies they have no debt they have capital they have cash in the balance sheets and some of these companies have cash that is greater than the reserves of many countries in the balance sheet which has driven so therefore this is not a kind of some kind of a you know uh, jackpot uh, but the real out outcome so something people have to look at it very similarly when you look at a crypto ecosystem versus just a cryptocurrency maybe the transient growth of the cryptocurrencies in valuation may taper but the underlying growth from three trillion to ten trillion dollars in value is not too far out of the realms as the market gains momentum so Sridharji, this is a uh, very good uh, information for our viewers about who is investing in this and the fact that cryptocurrencies have a combined valuation uh, in excess of three trillion dollars many of them have money sloshing in their accounts and um, the so everything is for tomorrow everybody is expecting that this is where it's going to be used uh, however in terms of adoption even bitcoin we have talked about this in the past that the adoption has been fairly limited that the counterparty in many cases has been china on any transaction involving a bitcoin this was the case maybe a few months ago maybe it has changed it doesn't matter sir what i'm asking you is so many cryptocurrencies so much opportunities for the investor how does one sift the grain from the chaff i think it's a great question um in my view i think you still stick to the fundamentals you keep a very close eye on the evolution of the ecosystem this is not uh you know you put the money in a bank and then you go to sleep and you assume that one day you wake up you have you will see significant amount of gyrations driven by the volatility that is driven by several factors okay right now the appreciation and depreciation is driven by essentially two or three factors one factor is the how they see the volume of activity plus because there is a limited number of there's a limited amount in supply when there is an abnormal cash comes in then you're going to see uh, uh the demand for it to grow up and the price to for it to grow up but once the trade is complete then you will begin to see some normalization one should not be caught in that whirlwind uh, when you have momentary trades because of the velocity and the volume of money that is coming in driving artificially the price up but if you make the money in that short cycle of time well done if you lose the money well bad luck uh, we have seen you know forty thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars we have seen fifty thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars in less than a month you made money great but somebody is going to lose money either but overall you know you have grown from about twenty thousand dollars to fifty to sixty thousand dollars that's almost again you know three hundred percent growth if you're talking about twenty to sixty thousand dollars so that's just purely on the trading side but the investments are not just purely happening on the currencies the investments are happening on exchanges investments are happening on the infrastructure investments are happening around the, what's the next generation of asset management models within this ecosystem investments are happening around how yields you know are there people borrowing and lending in this ecosystem very similar to peer-to-peer -peer models so therefore you need to study the full ecosystem and look at how you deploy the cap the various funds that are that are in the market within the crypto then you need to uh, study and you know go deep into uh, making your investment disinvestment type of decisions so i think that would be my answer as to everything is in details and everything requires uh, tremendous study and understanding you know on a relative sense i come from traditional world okay i've seen money change from cash to what we see today 
you know, over the last 45 years or 42 or 44 years or 45 years of the evolution of the cash. But what I can say to people is this is this is real and this is going to happen. It may not be like tomorrow you go to your grocery store and give a Bitcoin, but you begin to see this adjacent ecosystem operating in parallel uh, and it is very well uh, modeled and very well thought out as a play. This what you call abnormal uh, one out profits is only transient. But that is why you need to study and you need to spend time and you need to test and learn your way rather than jump into it blindly. Thank you very much, Sridhar Ji. And I'm going to, before we conclude this, I'm going to give you a curveball question, sir. And uh, perhaps you can uh, rid me of my doubt. Elon Musk said that he'll accept Bitcoins for Teslas. And then he walked it back. Do you know why, sir? Well, I think that the um, uh, it's sometimes you put um, many of these people put a cart before the horse. Um, you put the cart before the horse. You know, for you to make those types of statements, um, you got to be very careful. Which is to say, first and foremost, is there sufficient depth in the system? That's number one. Number two, are you discriminating your market one over the other? which is, should not be the case. He should sell the car to anybody rather than say, yeah, Bitcoin also accept uh, this particular uh, person to be. Uh, so that's number two. I think the number three, which is even more relevant is, as I mentioned to you, it is this is not yet a regulated system. Okay, you buy a car. So uh, I go and buy a Tesla or go and lease a Tesla. Then where's my money you know my money is coming from a bank account or my money is coming you go in and put a tesla you give him a bitcoin the question is yes there's a kyc behind it then you get into a whole slew of questions has he paid tax is this out of gains how do you kind of account for it and therefore you know uh, is it your responsibility tesla to hold this coin uh, you know, they may not, they may have overcome AML, uh, anti-money laundering. I'm just giving a benefit of doubt. But have they paid taxes? No. There's no way in the world anybody has paid taxes for. That is why you have 19-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds, you know, walking away with 1 million and 5 million and 8 million because Janet Ellen is saying, oh my God, I haven't taxed this person. I haven't taxed. I have to tax all these Bitcoin transactions so I can probably fund Biden's build back better America. So none of this is transactional integrity. So therefore, I think he jumped the gun a little too ahead of the curve. Thank you so much, Sridhar Ji. I think uh, we've learned a wealth of information from this hangout. And viewers, as always, it is P. Guru's uh, view that you should be educated in all aspects of any technology. We try to be the tip of the spear. And Sridhar Ji, thank you so much, sir. I know how much work went into preparing for this talk. It is not easy. There's a lot of data that has been shared. And you, the viewer, we would appreciate it very much if you could put in your comments what you think of this and this kind of a series of talks where you, we give you a concentrated amount of information with a lot of data backing it up so that you can make an informed decision moving forward. Thank you once again, Sridharji, and Namaskar. Thank you, Namaskar. Have a good day. I hope you are, the conversation was uh, productive and we continue to we will continue to evolve in this journey to be transparent. Uh, we are uh, crypto investors in the ecosystem. Uh, not per se on the coins. Uh, of course, we may invest in coins, but we are broad ecosystem players. I'm just a beginner. If I have to use that particular phrase, uh, there are people, including my son, uh, who is uh, uh, a genius in this specific domain. Um, so therefore, uh, there is a lot of science behind it. There's a lot of maths behind it. And there's a lot of technical analytics behind it. But the ecosystem looks extraordinarily interesting as, uh, as it takes shape. Thank you very much, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar. Have a good day.